State of the Union. So I've, uh, one of my claims to fame, other than being, looking like some old guy with beards, thank you very much. <laughs> she told me she was gonna make one joke about me, so that's kinda cool. Um, is that, um, yes, I was at the first DevOps days in Ghent. In fact, I was the only American there. And, but um, another kind of claim I have is, I've been to more DevOps days than anybody else on the planet. Um, but I do a lot of the keynotes too. It's become kind of a start of the, the you know, one of the things I do. What's interesting though is for um, the longest time people would invite me to a keynote at DevOps days and we'd call it State of the Union DevOps and I would just go ahead and talk about whatever I felt like. And then in Chicago this year they, were, they, they caught on. And so they asked me to do the keynote and then I was planning on doing some really cool stuff about immutable delivery and all that kind of, and they're like, oh, John, one thing, we really want it to be a state of the union. So, uh, so I did, I actually sat down and I spent a fair amount of time <coughs> thinking about what's happened over the six years since we've kind of coined the term. And this is basically the presentation that I gave in Chicago, although there's a couple of things added to it. Um, I, I won't spend too much time myself. Um, I've been doing this a really long time. I've always been in IT operations. That's kind of my passion. Um, I, um, I actually was one of the original cloud evangelists at Canonical for the first private cloud. Um, but probably uh, more importantly, I was early in our staff. I built uh, OpsCode's customer facing business. I was a nice person there. And, uh, and then over the last few years, the startup, startup gods have been very nice to me. Um, I sold a company to Dell about two and a half, three years ago, and seven months ago I sold a company to Docker called Soccer Plan. Um, I am a core organizer, and um, probably the other thing that might be interesting to you is I do a DevOps Cafe podcast. In fact, uh, um, I, I have a slide coming up on that, but um, and, and, and you know, not you know, I don't care for a promotion standpoint. I will tell you some of the people that we interview are some of the most amazing people. Um, we had Mary and Tom Poppendick in an interview. I mean, if, if you know who Mary Poppendick is, she's the one who introduced Lean to software. Um, we had Cindy Decker, who's uh, some really good stuff. All right, so the agenda is, um, you know, when I went back and I started thinking about um, how do you um, how do you do State of Union right now? What's going on? And I, I thought about like these uh, these loose taxonomies that have arisen over the years about how we describe. Uh, DevOps. One of the things we always get hammered in as DevOps, say, practitioners or evangelists is, okay, give me the canonical definition of DevOps. And the answer is there is none, right? And so the best that we've done so far is things like taxonomies. And I'll talk about a couple of those. And then something really interesting, too, is over the last four years, but or certainly the last two years, um, Puppet Labs and Gene Kim, and we'll talk about those, uh, Gene and, and, and that group, and in fact, I was fortunate enough this last year to, to be involved in some of the questions. We've been doing these DevOps surveys, and uh, they're really rendering some interesting information about the things that we talk about. You know, we get up here and we talk about like, do CI, do CD, do this, right? The thing is, we actually now have data, um, and it's growing data, and we'll talk about that. And then, um, you know, next week, actually, I fly Sunday back to San Francisco, It'll be our second, uh, what's called the DevOps Enterprise Summit, where it's a conference dedicated to large enterprises that are doing, again, run by, mainly by Gene, but I'm one of the organizers, where we have some of the largest corporations, the legacy of legacy. I think, um, you know, Barclays is speaking this year, and I think that they're, they're like a 125-year-old company, right? Like, they're going up and gonna do a presentation on how they do DevOps, right? So, it's an interesting, uh, conference, you should look it up. I doubt you'd be able to make it, <laughs> given it starts Monday. But uh, we do videotape, so I'll talk about that. And then I like to say, if we have time, oh yeah, we might actually talk about technology. So, um, so I was at the first Get DevOps days, right? It was about 35, 40 people. I kind of accidentally stumbled into it. Um, I was working for Canonical at the time, and this gentleman named Patrick DeBar was um, was starting to write some stuff about like dev and ops and why it's broken, and, and I just started following him. And, and when I meet people that are really interesting, I go out of my way to become to know more about them. And and I pestered him, pestered him, and he says like, "Shut up, just come over into the conference." And then you know, and that's basically what I did is I went over to this, the first DevOps Days conference. 
And what happened was, when I left there, I came back to my good friend David Edwards, who we do a we've been doing a DevOps Cafe podcast for about a year and a half at that point. And I said, we need to do this in the U.S. We have to do this in the U.S. So we actually organized the first DevOps days in the U.S. in 2010, and 300 people showed up. So this is 2010, 300 people showed up, right? It was insane. And it was, you know, how many people is this your first DevOps days? How many people think that what you experienced yesterday was amazing? Yeah, everybody, right? Like, imagine that in 2010 with 300 people and, and just your mind being blown, right? Like, the first time, right? And so we did a podcast right after that, and we literally normally put guests on our show, but this time we were like, we actually wanted to try to figure out ourselves. So you can, you know, I can show you the podcast where we're sitting there going, what happened? This was crazy. And we actually accidentally came up with an acronym called CAMS, and it's been, you know, it has stuck over the years. People refer to, you know, this culture, automation, management, and sharing, or some people call it management and sharing, right? And so it, it has been at least a way to try to get people to understand in, I call it a loose taxonomy of like, okay, you know, I can't tell you everything about that. In fact, I was having a conversation with some of the guys in the booth, you know, it's funny, like, I do Amazon, am I DevOps? Right, eee, you know, I mean, the, the thing is, it, it's hard, right? Like the, the breadth of what we call DevOps loosely can be described in thousands and tens of thousands of different ways. And the argument that it's not DevOps is not a solid argument. So anyway, this taxonomy has done us well over time. Um, and, and at the time I worked for Chef and I wrote this blog article, What Does DevOps Mean to Me? And it's actually, over the years, I, it's funny, I'll see on Twitter somebody will say, hey, just saw this great art article. This is like 2010, right? Um, and, and it really, it, it was a long version of me trying to explain what this thing was, and I explained it by saying that it's culture first. Um, over the years, people have said things like uh, CAMs, not AMs. You know, you, if you don't get the culture right, like, honestly, the technology, you know, I, I'll go as far as saying a waste of time. Thinking that you're just going to forklift a bunch of great technologies and, and not understanding how to change behavior, um, you, you're most likely going to fail. But here's the thing, when I was doing this State of the Union thing for, for the Chicago DevOps, I was reassessing what I've been saying about CAMS for years. And over the last two or three years, I've been very obsessed with um, complexity, complexity theory. Uh, how does complexity play into just IT infrastructure? And, um, and if, you've, if anybody has kind of thought or studied or thought, you, you realize that everything becomes kind of feedback loops. Um, there's a great book I'll show you later by a friend of mine um, where he talks a lot about, um, you know, cybernetics and cybernetic feedback loops, right? And, and then uh, we talk a lot, if, you, if you've watched some of the videos from a lot of DevOps days, you'll see people often talk about the OODA loop, right? And, 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 the, and what, we, what, what, what it means is a lot of what we do, if we do it correctly, is not just a one point in time Ah, I'm going to do this, right? It's it's a it's a it's a feedback loop, and and I realized CAMS is actually a feedback loop. I kind of had this epiphany when I was writing the presentation for them. Like, so culture, we talk about continuous improvement, right? Our culture is done right, a continuous improvement. We're continually improving, no matter whether we like it or not. Our automation, which we might call continuous delivery. But that's a large bucket for everything that we deliver, and I, it sounds like there was a lot of great conversations about CI and CD yesterday. <coughs> there is no, it, it is a fact that whatever you deliver and how well you deliver it, it's your culture that drives that, right? Um, it, it, you know, it, and, and, and how you think the delivery is working, good or bad, your culture is, is, the, um, is the, the genesis and the framework for that. And then if we're really doing it right, and then what we're actually doing is we're measuring the results of what we do. And that becomes our continuous learning. Right? We don't learn unless we measure. And by the way, in DevOps, I hope you've heard this before, we kind of like failure. 
Failure is a good thing. Uh, there's an author I'll talk about in a little bit called Mike Rotha. He says if you look in the dictionary of failure, there's nothing bad. There's no like, stay away, failure, warning. It, it doesn't have a bad connotation. In fact, when you think like a scientist, failure is a positive thing, right? So the, the measurement part is the part that we, if we're doing this right, we're understanding our culture, we're getting our automation baked really well. We're using our chef or a puppet, maybe Docker, or, um, whatever um, you think works well. But understand that it's sandwiched by culture and it's sandwiched by if you're, you're not going to be doing well unless you're treating this like a science project, scientific method 101. And then the output is the sharing, that's your collaboration. So um, I, I think a lot more now about CAMS as a feedback loop that is, and you, you can call it an OODA loop or a cybernetic feedback loop or just feedback in general, it is a loop. Um, I've been obsessed with this author over the last three months. I've actually read the book twice now um, and his name is Mike Rother. Um, the, there, there was a bunch of um, people out of, in the US um, basically I think in the late 80s, early 90s who were trying to figure out why Toyota was just destroying U.S. car manufacturers. I mean, like, to a point where nobody would buy an American car. And so these people from MIT and some students went ahead and they did a bunch of research. A gentleman, Jim Womack, wrote a book called The Machine That Changed the World. And um, Mike Rother was one of the kind of students of that group. And that group actually the ones who coined the term lean. Right? And Mike Rother was one of those students. Mike Rother was so impressed by this, he decided to go to work for Toyota for two years, just so he could understand. And this Kata book, how many people heard of value stream mapping? Um, well, the, the canonical book there is called Learning to See, and that's written by Mike Rother. Well, Mike Rother has written this book called Toyota Kata. And, and what, what Mike um, has, I call Mike now, because we actually converse over, uh, over email now, we become friends is that the, uh, the thing that people looked at Toyota, and this is an important message here for, for when we look in DevOps and we start thinking about, like, oh, I like the way that company runs. How can I be like that company? Ooh, they, they, they run Stats D or they run this. It, what Rafa said is most people who looked at Toyota didn't see the invisible part of Toyota, right? They, they, they tried to copy the things like a Kanban an and on cord, or all these things that were like tools of Toyota. And in this book, he talks about there was an invisible um, kata, you know, culture, behavior, habit, autonomic behavior that was built behind those tools. So the meta message here is the tools are great, but if they're not being built in a way that creates kata, in your organization, autonomics. You do things because you know if if the if this plate was to fall right now, I'd probably block it, and I wouldn't even think about it because it would be part of my autonomic safety system. And and so to that point, we have a company in the U.S. that we consider a poster child for DevOps. They're called Etsy. John Osbar. If you haven't heard of him, you should read everything he talks about. He's an amazing man. Um, Etsy is an amazing operational model for how to do DevOps in almost every way. They have a tool that they use, which is called a blameless postmortem. Right? How many people heard of a blameless postmortem? Right? Fair amount. If you haven't, you should research this. This is a really good idea. But it's a tool. And the thing here is, in 2013, uh, this Bethany um, Bethany Markey, she wrote, she worked for Etsy. She wrote a tool to help manage blameless postmortems. Great. Hey, I like Etsy. I'm going to do blameless postmortems. Good. Let me get her tool. We're going to win, right? But here's the thing. At, at I think 22, at basically near the end of the presentation, somebody asked her this question. They said, "When you do the, you use your tool and you do the blameless postmortem, how do you ensure that the action items in the blameless postmortem are followed through?" And literally, that was her face. She's probably mad at me for showing this picture. But uh, her face was like, and she, she, you can watch the video. She stands and she's like, she doesn't understand the question. And the reason she doesn't understand the question, in fact, what she winds up saying is, I have no idea how to answer that question 
And then she pauses, and she says, it would literally never occur to me not to do it. And here's the thing. That's in Etsy's kata. They, one of the things Ratha said when Americans would go over to, to Japan to understand Toyota, they'd ask these simple questions, and they, they, the workers would be like, I don't know what you're talking about. Because they didn't even understand the question because it was so deep in their DNA of how they did things. And Aristotle says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. Um, if you want to really understand what I've just been talking about, read Mike Prother's Toyota Kata. It's an amazing book. So, let's get back to some more um, retrospective of the State of the Union for DevOps. Good friend of mine, actually, coincidentally, if I was really smart, I would have did this on purpose, he actually, um, Dave Zwieback, who actually runs workshops for post blameless postmortems. Um, you can get him to come over here next year. He'll run one. They're amazing. Absolutely amazing. But he wrote a blog article, um, I guess about a year ago or so, uh, 2000, yeah, so early this year, um, said that DevOps is another loose, um, a loose taxonomy is called ICE. And I love this, right? And as the author of Ken's be like, oh my God, somebody's taking over. But no, this is really good. Um, and what he says is that DevOps is inclusivity, complexity, and empathy. So I, I respectfully hand the reins of loose taxonomies over to Dave because I really do like this. And so what he means is, in um, for the inclusivity, like DevOps days, is it inclusive? Like, you know, it's funny. Back in 2010, we ran the first one. 2011, if you asked how many people in a room it was their first DevOps days, you'd probably get about 25%. Right? In 2013, you'd get about 50-50. I will tell you the last four that I've been to, it's at least 75 to 80% of people in the room are first-time attendees at DevOps days. We are doing a really good job of inclusivity. We're inviting people in. I'll talk about the DevOps survey. Diversity. It's a fact. Um, you know, I mean, we don't get more, um, I look at this room, I think our ratio is pretty good. In the U.S., I speak to rooms of three, four hundred, six hundred people, I can count on my hand the amount of women that are in the room, right? Like, we, we need to, you know, there, there's so much value in diversity, um, you know, and then I think, you know, getting the enterprise to buy in, security, networking. Um, one of the things I think, speaking of kind of a technology Inclusion is if you haven't heard of the what's called the rugged movement. How many people are rugged? All right, good one. Yeah, cool. If I had prize to give you, I'd give you, but I don't have anything to give you. So, uh, the uh, but it, it's really it's it's some really amazing people. I mean, amazing people that have figured out. In fact, one of them is named Josh Cor Corman, who I just adore. Josh Corman, you know, man crush times ten. Um, he, um, he, he's, uh, he's kind of a white hat security guy. In fact, Gene is the one that convinced, in fact, I, Gene says, Gene Kim says, I'm the one that helped him convince that DevOps wasn't a sham. And Gene went convinced the security community that DevOps wasn't a sham. And guys like Josh Karin got involved in something called Rugged, which is kind of their offshoot of Rugged DevOps, which is how do you include security and all the things that have to be done as part of security into this kind of tool chain. So today, it's not uncommon to see people who get rugged very well to inject in the CI loop um, vulnerability scans into code, right? So there's a brilliant set of things by really smart security people who have bought into this DevOps things that are actually injecting their ideas into the things that we've been doing for a few years with uh, software delivery. So there is a rugged manifesto, um, you know, rugged, ruggedsoftware.org, um, read it up, learn about it. There's some great products being built around it. Um, um, Josh Corman also spends a lot of time talking about software delivery and providence of software. Um, you know, he, uh, and, and one of the things that, I, again, I, I'm trying to drive this inclusion thing, like let's get the security people, because they think, they think about things that at least I'm not a security person, I don't think about. And Josh Corner pointed out to me that Verizon, in a 2014 report, um, every year they do a vulnerability report. 
And, and so in 2014, they did a vulnerability report. And basically in this report, it said 97% of all compromises in 2014 were due to 10 known vulnerabilities, CVEs. So the US government has this thing called National Institute of Standards and Technology where they list known vulnerabilities. So 97% of every compromise, at least according to the, the Verizon survey, were narrowed down to only 10 CVEs. All right? That's not the interesting part. The interesting part is eight of those 10 were over 10 years old. Right? Like, we're doing a really bad job of taking security serious in all this thing. In fact, Josh says that you think you write 300 lines of code or 30 lines of code. Like, you, you just wrote 30 lines of code. If you're using open source, probably 3 million lines of code. Right? Because all the abstractions that you pull them. Again, I'm just trying to get you to think about other areas. Now, complexity is a whole other ballgame, right? Like, I, I wish I could have an hour to spend on just complexity because I think this is fascinating. Uh, if you think about companies like Netflix and Facebook and, and how they run, they completely get that complexity is part of their world. You get to a world where thinking that you're deterministically monitoring these things and managing things just doesn't work. And in fact, in Netflix, how many people heard of the concept of chaos monkey? A lot of people, right? So Netflix, for those who don't, Netflix runs uh, a set of services. You know, there's one, there's many, and I don't have time to go into all of them, but one is called Chaos Monkey, and it actually purposefully, randomly kills servers. It, it, it lives by this kind of anti-fragile concept, like the, if you break it, it makes it stronger. So I had, I, I know Adrian Krakow, he's one of the primary architects of Netflix, and, and you should like seek out anything he ever says, because he's another, Another man crush coming here. I, he's a brilliant man. Um, but he says, uh, we had him on a podcast, and I asked him flat out, you know, how do you get from zero to 60 to Chaos Monkey? Because you don't just put Chaos Monkey in a production environment that has doesn't have the, the batten down the hatches infrastructure. Because then you do get fired. <laughs> um, but but he said, you know, he says, he said, well, you know, he says, first of all, he's a, uh, he's very, um, he's a generous person because he says, you know, it wasn't me, John. He says, what I did is, I got the right books to the right people. And one of the books that he gave to the right person in Netflix was a book by Mike Darner called Release It. How many people heard of Release It? You're a software developer, you, uh, and you're a practice agile, right? You, this is mandatory reading. Part of one of the things that Mike talks about is something called circuit breaker patterns. So you don't get the chaos mode. Chaos mode sounds great, right? Like, what if I really bought into that? I like the idea of like randomly killing prop services and because we, I get that if I do that, my developers are going to have to adapt and be stronger and more, right, more resilient code, and my infrastructure gets more resilient, and it's a, it's a whole concept of resiliency. Uh, but the point is you don't put that in unless you have some kind of framework in place. Well, circuit breaker patterns is something that, um, that Netflix does very well. And then you think about a circuit breaker in your house, right? If you overload a particular circuit, it shuts down just that section. So they design all of their software and services transactions based on this principle that it's bounded and when it breaks, it should only break the one thing. Think, for example, if you're using a service that recommends things. Not a critical service, if, this, if part of that service dies, it's decoupled from everything, and the only thing you get is when you hit, hey, recommend me the best book or the movie, it just doesn't work at that time. The second book that he, um, he gave to some other people is uh, from a gentleman called Sidney Decker, um, if you know John Osbar, basically, this is, John just got his thesis on human factors and safety. And what, what, what John, and I will almost give John sole credit for this, is trying to take the principles of people who think about how do you figure out what the human factors were when there are a plane crash or when a baby dies in a hospital. Did the, uh, did the person actually grab the wrong needle? Right? Was there two needles right next to each other and you really should have done the left one and you, and you were in a rush and you grabbed the right one and gave the wrong medicine? Right? These people, in fact, Sidney Decker doesn't do IT. He's not an IT person. He, again, he thinks about human factors and, and, I, and uh, in one of his canonical books, he's got many as the field guide to understanding human error. And so at Netflix, this was mandatory reading early on. Because it, under, it explains to you that complexity 
in complex environments, here's the, here's the head fake. It's never the human's fault. You know, Deming, uh, again, you may or may not have heard of Deming. Deming says it's a 96% for. Any problem that ever happens, 96% chance it's a system. 4% chance it's a person. If you go to Etsy, it's like 99.9999999% chance it's the system. It's always the system. Right? Complex systems mandate that. Humans are just actors in the system. And then finally, if you want to read a book that really just like is a dissertation on complexity and sorority. My dear friend Mark, Mark Burgess, uh, how many people heard a product called Chef? How many people heard a product, I'm kind of kidding with you, how many people have heard a product called Puppet? How many people have heard a product called CF Engine? All right, so Puppet and Chef do not exist without Mark Burgess. Mark Burgess actually invented desired state convergent infrastructure, what we know as infrastructure as code. Uh, he wrote a book about two years ago in Search of Certainty. It is a very hard book to read if you're not an engineer. But it is worth reading even if you're not an engineer. And one other thing, I, 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 uh, what's interesting here is I've been looking for a home for this. Because it's fascinating, but I still haven't found a place to implement it in my life yet. Or my implementation. But I do know some people, and in fact, one of the places that shows up right now a lot in, in discussions about plans plus water. It's called Kinevin. Welsh spelling, so don't even figure out why it's called Kinevin. But it is a model of dealing with complexity, and it is extremely interesting in that you basically try to create five quadrants of assessing complexity. Because complexity is, things happen in different ways. Sometimes things are obvious. Obvious mandates that it's a known known. I know what to do. I, I've seen this a gazillion times. I shut off this switch when that happens. Piece of cake. But complicated is, it's a known unknown, right? I, like, I kind of know what that is, but I'm not really sure um, what it is. And, and what, what Canaveral mandates is, I need to understand that I, I react to that different than a known known. Um, and, and, you know, and, and so for example, in obvious is I sense, I categorize, I respond. In complicated, I sense, I analyze, I respond. Right, so the point is, I can't categorize it because it's kind of, I know what it is, I just don't know exactly what it is. Right, and, and, and anybody who talks about cadaver will like get really violent, like, make sure you know the difference between complicated and complex, because they're not the same. Like, I'm not a zealot on this subject, but, but complex now is, all bets are off. Right, it's an unknown, unknown, um, but, but it is within an imaginable realm. Things become emergent. We, we, the, the, the known quantity of this is we start trying to look for emergent patterns. And in fact, if you go back and read Mark's book, he spends a lot of time helping you understand how to do that. In fact, in a lot of ways, Sidney Decker does too. But, but here is a world where we start switching over to, when we get into environments that are, um, you know, the, the guys at Facebook told me that, this is like two years ago, they wrote um, an automated remediation system. And it does remediation on, on basically kind of known things, right? But it's all emergent, it's based on probability. And by the way, they told me if they turned it off, they'd have to hire 200 people to replace it. So, and there's the last but least, which is kind of, it's an unknowable. These would we would call a black swan. These are things that like happen um, the, you know, massive outages that have just become these, um, like, unbelievably complex set of events. Um, you know, I mean, for those who think about safety and all that, the, you know, the, the story you'll hear, well, there's two stories you hear a lot now today in DevOps, one more than the other. Um, the Night Capital story. How many people heard a Night Capital story? Yeah, so quite a few. A few there. It's, a, it's a brilliant story of, of chaotic. I mean, it's literally a high frequency trading company, second largest high frequency trading company in the US. I think it was, it was over 75 years old. Um, they basically put a production chain, they put a test change in production in a high frequency trading um, scenario. It, trading went nuts. They were out of business in 24 hours. I mean, out of business. I'm not talking about just like, oh, things were bad, people got fired. I mean, out of business, shut down, over, done. It, it's an amazing story. In fact, the, the Security Exchange Commission mandated that there was a write-up on it. Brilliant story. 
Um, the other one is the Air France 447. Right, there's another great example of cat. Anyway, this is an interesting tool. Um, some of the people doing uh, blameless postmortems are using this tool in trying to actually assess how you do a postmortem. And then finally, empathy. Right, in this ICE acronym, um, you know, I think um, a good friend of mine, Jeff Sussner, wrote um, a blog article that the that empathy, the essence of DevOps, and it's a brilliant article. In fact, the biggest thing about it is one of those ones where, damn, I wish I would have wrote that one. You know, um, because it was, it, it really, he, he captured something that we all kind of knew. You know, uh, it, you know, DevOps is about empathy, right? Like, DevOps, right? You know, prior to this whole discussion, it's like, you son of a bitches, you, throw, you gave us some horrible code. Screw you, you screwed it up in operations, right? <laughs> like, like, that was the discussion. And, and, you know, and empathy is more about, whoa, whoa, whoa calm down, everybody. <laughs> Let's think about what they think. And in fact, early on, um, actually, hopefully in March, I have a book coming out with Gene Kim and Patrick Bear called The DevOps Cookbook. And we, I, I wrote the whole section on embedded engineers, which is a forced form of empathy. You know, how do you get the dev people to think like operations? Well, if you're a forward-thinking company, you take an operations person and just put them in that group. They're in a stand-up every day. Uh, blameless postmortem, safety culture. Safety culture, going back to things about Sidney Decker and and some of the things I've already talked about. In the end, um, this is not a feedback loop, ICE, but empathy drives inclusion and complexity. Um, you're, you know, your, your inclusion is clearly a, a, a sense of empathy. Um, like, how do we think about how the other people are thinking? How can we get more of these people to think like us, or us to think like them? Um, and then complexity is actually also a form of empathy, of understanding how complex environments behave. Um, there's, um, I, I'll do this quick, quick in the uh, DevOps survey, which I'm about to get into here in a minute. Um, there's this thing called the Westrom novel, and this actually comes from Jez Humble. He actually introduced this to Gene, and I got to understand it through the survey. Um, it's, it's an interesting model. I won't spend a whole lot of time on it, but in this Westrom model, um, he talks about three forms of an organization. There's a pathological, uh, bureaucratic, and generative. And, and if you look at any one of these, um, these examples, um, you can, you can kind of get a sense of, and here's the key, at least these categorized, like these things we know, right? Like, hey, that company's pretty good because the messengers aren't shot. Right? Safety culture is that um, the, um, let's see what time I've got before I can get myself in trouble here. This, this is an interesting story. You can go on. Oh, you can go on? Thank you. Um, in the Toyota Kata book, right, so one of the things that, a, a, that Toyota did is they had this thing called the Andon cord. And in a production line, the thing was you can pull the Andon cord and stop the line. And it was designed, you know, it, and, and funny because in Western culture, and I have arguments with people about this, they said, well, the Andon cord doesn't work because the person who pulls it gets fired. But not at, not at Toyota. At Toyota, they built some Kata into the process because so the idea was that you were responsible for not letting defects go down line. That was what you were supposed to be all about. And so if you saw a defect, in fact, even if you saw what was looked like some like shadow from the light that looked like a crack in the piece of the material, you pulled the cord. And you know what happened the first time you did that? The leader, the team leader would come up and they would say, thank you. Before they even started to figure out what happened, they instilled the behavior that they wanted you to think in a way that you felt safe about pointing out failure. And because in Toyota, failure always meant we will learn. And even if the failure wasn't even a failure, it might be that that light shines the wrong way and makes it look like a crack. And we just learned that there are probably 40 other factories in the world that have the same problem. So it, it's, a, it's a freaky way to think. And, and that's why Toyota it calls it, um, you know, it calls it the kind of invisible kata. Well, all these things are part of this. You know, the, you know failure is covered up in a pathological. If we go to generative, Failure causes inquiry. I want to know. One other story, really cool. In a Toyota Kata book, I just wrote a blog article about this on G on the IT revolution about the history of the Enron card. There was one point at a Toyota that per shift they were pulling a thousand Enron cords per shift, 
And then all of a sudden it went down to 700. And as Mike Roth says that in a Western culture, they'd be like, yeah, we did great. We're down to 700. We're not pulling the end on court. The, uh, the CEO called it all hands and said, we got a problem here. Either A, we're letting defects get past the system, which is bad, or B, we're not running to capacity. Because we know we can do a thousand and arm code poles a shift. He said, well, Lieutenant, why? Because you know what? More and arm poles equals more learning. And so what, what, the, what the CEO of Toyota at the time was saying is, by not pulling 300 less times a shift, we were learning, we were learning less 300 times. <coughs> And of course, Gene Kim's The Phoenix Project. How many people have, I, I don't know, how many people have not read The Phoenix Project? Ah, all right, you need to all read The Phoenix Project. If you want, I'll buy you the book. Um, the, should, more people should raise their hands. Um, the, uh, it, it, it really is, uh, it's a novel. It describes a scenario of everything that we think about that is positive about it. It was a 10 year labor of love by Gene. It's based on an original novel from an original management thing called L.A. Gorat. And it is about empathy. Um, and then, um, this is an amazing book. You know, it's funny, I have a lot of good friends that send me early copies of their book, and I hate that. Because about eight out of ten times, the book sucks. And then I have no idea what to do after I read it. But every once in a while, a good friend of mine sends me a book where I have no problem telling everybody in a room like this that you should read this book. It's an amazing book. I, Jeff is very, Jeff kind of coined the whole DevOps empathy idea. Uh, but he, if you want to think about UX, UX design, service delivery, I, I, I would tell you this book is a really, really well, first time author, well written. Um, does a really good job explaining complexity, Kinevin, how it fits into what we do. Very good book. Um, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, I think some of you might know uh, uh, early this year, I was at an event in LA and this young man that I've gotten to know over a couple of years committed suicide. And it, it, it buried me. I wrote a blog about it called Carry Off Shoe. It's about, it's a form of burnout that where people commit suicide because we burn out. Um, I, I, I'm really, I, I've done a, a lot of my keynotes have actually been on this subject as well, is that we need to be, like, well, this is fun, Kaizen, we're doing great stuff here. Everybody that's here I suspect is very, um, I suspect the pe companies that you work for are going to benefit from the fact that you're here. But be very careful about, you know, like, getting engulfed in brilliant things to create things much better and be better than everybody else, because that's what we do in DevOps. Be careful that you don't let it get into what we would call a danger zone and be like some of these casualties we've seen in our industry. Um, there's a group of people, and I'm included, to try to figure out how do we deal with you. Know, some of you people are young, brilliant, smart. You might be single. You can work all hours of the night, and that's awesome. Be careful, all right? This article spends a lot of time with my thoughts on this. Um, uh, finishing up on the survey. Um, there's four years um, in 2014, so this year we just, the 2015 version came out. We learned a lot of things. We learned, um, I think the first year, uh, first two years were very small numbers. In 2014 we had 10,000 respondents. We learned things like um, high performing organizations uh, or high trust organizations. High trust, I, I trust, I trust my people. I assume, it's a great, a great story. Um, Really good story of a friend of mine that does a lot of presentations at Dallas. He says, this is another kind of blow your mind. He, he tells the story where, um, of a, a trust scenario. So, my best friend, he's in a room. I say, hey, can you watch my dog? I gotta go eight hours. You come back in the room. Your best friend is holding a gun. The dog is dead. Smoke coming out of him. And the thing that you say to that person is, thank you because I know the only reason you would have shot my dog is it was in pure pain and it needed to be put out of its misery. Right? There's a message there about empathy and understanding high trust organizations. And if you think about all the safety culture, if something breaks, like, Bill, why'd you break it? Or 
or or even if Bill um, basically did something that seemed so stupid, the assumption is there was no other option. Bill had to do that. When you get an organization, if you can create a culture of an organization where the, where the assumption <coughs> is that um, that the, the glass is always half full on every decision. Uh, Cross-functional collaboration, shared responsibility. But here's, here's um, as we wind down, um, in 2014, on the right-hand side of this, what we found out that, is, that um, we say is high-performing and low-performing organizations. And this survey you can download. You, you have to kind of register with Puppet, but, but they, they don't pester you too much um, when, when you download it. And it's worth filling out the form for them, because it's, it's an amazing port. 14 and 15 are both. In the 14, we found that high-performing organizations versus low-performing organizations deploy software um, in about 30 times faster, uh, 30, 30x more deploys, that's fine. Uh, deploy lead time 200x better. But here's where it gets interesting. On the right, their mean time to resolve, 48 times faster to resolve problems in organizations that deploy more frequently. And then in 2014, we found out their success of rate of change was 3x. But here's where it gets insane. In 2015, we had 20,000 people respond, and the mean time resolve went up to 168%. So this adage that we, if we deliver faster, you're, some of you might go back to your organization and say, I think we need to deliver software quicker or faster. Like, oh, that's not good, it's gonna break. Show them this report. Because the truth of the matter is, it's just the opposite. You get better, you're faster. Your MTTR is better. Your, your change and reach success rate. Um, a um, couple of interesting companies I would definitely seek out. Target in the U.S. is doing amazing things as an enterprise company. They've got a lot of videos, especially at DevOps Days. Um, the DevOps Enterprise Summit has a, a fair amount of, uh, we, we, all the 2014 videos are up and alive. The 15, we're going to be next week, so I expect in about a month from now, all the 2015. Um, and then uh, we do have some working group stuff that's going to be published at this year. So there's about 30 of us that actually put created five projects to really zone in on, you know, demystifying top approaches, metrics, test automation, a lot of great data from some really big companies here. Um, anyway, um, you know, oh yeah, technology. I happen to like Docker. I think containers, um, microservices, and data gravity is the future for technology. Um, maybe we'll do an open spaces on that later, or I'd love to talk on a panel about what I think how the infrastructure looks. Um, these are the people when I ask for help. To get their opinion, to do a real survey that um, that actually sent me a bunch of information. Some of these people are the leaders in our industry, and uh, that's it. Thank you very much.